Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Nora po North Podcast for Interactive Media Games. Uh, my name is Marcus and this is my co-host Trusty. And uh, this week's guest is this one and only... Do you want to introduce yourself? Who are you? Where are you from? And uh, what do you do? Well, hi, um, I'm Eric Hammer. I teach predominantly on the animation and rigging courses that we have on the Interactive Media degree. So, uh, as you mentioned with the games, but I'm practically not on any of the games courses at all. So I might actually be a little bit of an unknown figure. <laughs> That's true. I mean, we had you in the first year, uh, especially as an animation, because you were a great part of Studio One, which is a cross uh, course uh, uh, course. Uh, but could you quickly tell us like all the different courses you teach for the different years? So on the first year, I teach uh, Studio One uh, out of the common courses. And I teach animation one and a rigging one. That's my three first year courses. And then on the second year, I teach uh, rigging two and animation two. This is fresh of this year. Uh, in the past, that's been uh, Diego's bag, and uh, I've been teaching animation three. But we swap around on occasion. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I do not teach on any courses on the third year, actually. <gasps> mm. Right. That's... So, tell us. Um... Where did it all start, if you like, go back? Um, could you tell us a little bit how you became the, this animation wizard? Because we have seen you in action, like in Studio One, like you mentioned. And mm -hmm. we have seen your like students do a, a lot of things. So could you tell us about your, like, maybe start on the school journey. It's like, where did you learn all this? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a fun story, I think. No, uh, I think... Um, I became an animation wizard a little <laughs> bit by accident. Yeah. It, it sort, of, sort of, animation happened to me. I didn't happen to it. Because <laughs> um, it started out, started out um, uh, around, around high school. I did, I did fine arts in high school. And not mm -hmm. because I was necessarily super interested in it, but, you know, it's the one thing I could do. I was the one guy in class. Oh, he's the one that's best at drawing. So... That was a lot, a lot, a huge part of my identity at the time. So I figured, yeah, okay, let's let's do some drawing. So I started fine arts. Now, if you do fine arts, then you get with a bunch of people who are really good at it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. At which point, it, my identity was, oh, I am the best at drawing, therefore I should do it. So then, when I started a class in fine arts, and I was not even remotely close to the top there. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I kind I kind of stopped. I just didn't do it. So I I delivered the bare minimum. And uh, so yeah, finishing high school, I realized okay, what do I want to do? So I I was contemplating law school, or I was contemplating uh, contemplating um, becoming a teacher, just regular elementary school teacher. And then I sat there. No, I I don't want to I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that twenty six year old with uh, minimal experience teaching a class because he hasn't lived anything. <laughs> This is this is eighteen year old me at the time, mind you. So, so but that's that was uh, the the uh, um, uh, thought process, and then comes the the dead year. Everyone has like a brief stint in the military, working in a hardware store, and um, then bef just before I was going to apply for to get a a, a teaching degree, uh, my sister asked me, "Hey, Eric, do you want to come watch Frozen with me?" <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'll do that. Because I'd only watch the, watch the posters on public uh, transportation. And the Norwegian campaign ad for Frozen was, uh, it was just Sven, the reindeer, and Olaf, the, the snowman. You never saw any of the sisters for some strange reason. So in my head, I thought, oh, this is a silly cartoon about a snowman that's lost his nose. And now he's recruiting the aid of a reindeer to help him find it. I hadn't I hadn't caught on that this was another uh, full release in the Disney Princess saga, right? <laughs> so I sat there, right, and I sat in a a uh, relatively small uh, cinema venue, but it had a full Dolby Atmos sound system. <laughs> so I came in with a total wrong expectation, and then I was just blown away by the opening act. I said, "Holy hell, this is a good film." Mm -hmm. And this was in this was, uh, during Christmas, right? So, uh, so uh, I travel home, I go to bed, n nothing out of the ordinary, and I wake up the next morning and just, holy shit! Uh, sorry, I shouldn't swear. That was a fantastic <laughs> film. 
Um, right. At, at which point I sat there, you know what, if I don't do anything with drawing or like that kind of visual creativity, I'm going to regret it. At which point I, I went, you know, let's, uh, I, I Googled and I found, okay, uh, animation, Norway, which education are available. Mm -hmm. Now this is about 10 years ago now. So at which point, uh, Norway Vocational was the only game in town at that time. Now we have, now there's a lot of schools offering animation, but a decade ago, not so much. So I applied for, for a vocational degree uh, in, in animation. And then I moved to uh, Trondheim. Because then, back then, Norof Trondheim was a thing. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Back in so, the day. Yeah. No, I, I said, and ever since that day, I've just absolutely loved it. It's been, it's been just really fun. And then, um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I did a vocational degree, and then uh, I wanted a, an actual a higher, uh, a, a BA or higher, right? So with a vocational, I then took that degree, and then there was an onboarding program, so I could complete it into a full uh, honors degree mm -hmm. in the UK. Ooh. Hmm. So Ooh, then I moved to the UK, and I lived there for a couple of years. Damn. Um, that was yeah. quite a journey. Yes. Um, that's how I got into animation, I think, uh, specifically, but, um, but I failed to mention that in this time, uh, I was working a lot in television. Yeah. So, um, doing, and, and television is gig based, right? So you, you get a gig, so you get, uh, oh, can you work on this show or can you work on this show? Can you work on that show? And, uh, everything from, and that was everything from just like pulling wires, a lot of pulling wires. To mm -hmm. calibrating uh, wires for wireless camera transmissions, to uh, shepherding people, the bunch of odd, odd jobs in television. So, yeah, yeah, I can't so, distract from the story there. But, uh, <laughs> so, would you? So, would you say uh, there has always been some kind of like, uh, what? How can you say it? like a not a hobby? It's like you always had this thought about. Uh, wanting to do something with like animation, visual like things, or did it just resonate with you like so much when you watched Frozen for the first time? Oh no, certainly no. I think I think uh, it's always been there. I've always enjoyed uh, visual mediums, and I've always enjoyed uh, animation and drawing and uh, and uh, sculpting. Although with clay at the time, and uh, yeah. but. I, I kind of strayed away from it because, you know, the idea that, oh, it's very hard to get a job. You're not going to get a job. It's not a safe job, even if you get a job. Um, and this was doubly enforced working in television, right, which is gig based. Right. OK, yeah. you got a gig. Cool. You have a lot of work for two weeks and then there could be a three month drought. Mm -hmm. till the next work comes in. And animation is much the same, right? You're working on a film. The production is done. Now you don't know when the next gig is going to come in. Yeah. So, so uh, while animation wasn't in the forefront of my mind, I had kind of left uh, visual arts behind. Mm -hmm. And Frozen was the nudge I needed to go, no, wake up. This is, this is where you want to be. So there was like a little bit like a, not a scare factor, more like a, a wake up. More like uncertainty about if you would get a job in this type of field, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and and uh, to some extent, I still feel that that fear, right? Yeah. Where where uh, it dawned on me that that uh, whenever I quit teaching, mm -hmm. I'll be up against you guys applying for the same jobs. <laughs> yeah. So I was sitting there like shit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, if if I teach if I teach too well, I will have shot myself in the foot. Yeah. But then I also realized, you know what? If I if if some of my students get chosen for a position ahead of me, then I'll walk out of that interview really proud, because that yeah. means I did my job right. You're just too good. Oh, imagine, <laughs> just... <laughs> imagine like in five years you decide to like try to join like Pixar or Disney or something, and you just meet Dennis or some animation student <laughs> like like oh, yeah. hey I, I, I I wouldn't be surprised. I mean. I, I, I have students who you know, like I look at their work now, and I say, like, I'm they're so much better than I was when I was uh, finishing uh, my degree. So I'm sitting there, like, no, 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 I would not be surprised if I bump into them. 
And isn't that the joy of being a teacher? Like potentially, it, no, it really is. It it really is the joy. Yeah, like seeing your your like, like we are the students. You will like listen to you and like in the future you may see our our name in like this frozen like the end like analog thing like you can like unlock him until uh, like the end credits <laughs> no that being said like like but th this is the thing about about teaching right this is something i had to learn the hard way when i first started being a teacher was that it's it's not really about what i do it's about what you do, because because you are the ones who are learning. I just happen to try to deliver the right thing at the right time in the right way. Mm -hmm. So, which is also why, like, I don't, I I have never enforced mandatory attendance, and I probably never will, because it's not about you being in my class that's important. It's how can I qualify that you know what you're supposed to do. That's one mm -hmm. part, and how can you actually learn as much as possible with your passion your interest and your skill set how yeah. can you maximize that yeah i mean personally when it comes to uh, going to the school just in general i feel like I, I get the most out of the assignment like oh you need to do this and uh even though we have lectures that like help us understand what we should uh, point towards when we want to come uh, complete the task it's it's usually uh, just having something that you need to get done that drives mm -hmm. you yeah, into the to goalpost. Yeah, no, because the the um, I mean, we spoke a little bit about pedagogy before we started recording, but the um, in teaching we have something known as the Dale's cone of experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to pull out any numbers because I don't recall them by heart. Uh, but it it is this uh, pyramid that describes which kind of learning activities you can do uh, and how much of that information you'll retain after a certain period of time. And yep. then you have you have uh, hearing. Well, hearing is at the absolute top. That's the one you'll remember the least, if I recall. And then you have hearing with visual aids, i.e., a lecture. That has uh, it's that encompasses the first two at the top. So we've now read about thirty percent or something like that of the information delivered will you retain. And then you have reading, which comes straight under there. So somehow reading is a little bit better, which I find yep. fascinating. But I I buy it. Re libraries have been around for however many thousands of years for a reason. Yeah. And then you start to get to the activity-based ones where you discuss and then you make and then you deliberate. And then at the bottom where you'll remember almost everything, that is when you are building an artifact. Which so, is making, why, yeah. so making the assignments are the like the biggest learning uh, like yeah. exercise. That's or rather, okay. rather not necessarily learning, but it's more about retention. Like, what what are you able to remember after a certain amount of time? Because you can, if you can recall everything I said in the lecture, ten minutes after the lecture, no way in hell you will be able to do that. But even if you could, yeah. that's not going to help you if you can't remember it in a year from now or two years from now. Yeah, but what you actually do and build that will stick, or at least mm. stick a whole lot more because you. I mean, you can forget even your own children if your brain's not put up for it. So everything is up for forgetting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, I, I like, um, I think the differences between like this school and other like colleges and other like uh, degrees is like I learn the math uh, most when I like fail and understand my failure and like, like it opens up like the door of curiosity is like wide open for probably animation and games in that regards it's like <clears throat> i learn the most when i do something instead of just taking an exam you know i just like read day before turn up for a math exam try my best get a six or like six out of ten and then just forget you know <laughs> but in this case i fail try something or like a other kind of workflow try to figure something out google talk to people uh, and i think i learned the best in that format which is great i think a lot of people resonate with that yeah and i mean and you're you're certainly not alone in that and i think that is the, the cool thing about about teaching and now that i have taught a few generations of students right that mm -hmm. there are certain trends that affect 
most people, right? Because at this point, you can start to apply statistics to it. And then you can actually say in a quantitative way that, oh, yeah, no, this is a way that a lot of people will learn best. Learning styles isn't a thing. It's been deproven every now and then. But I, you can still see who, which students will engage more with a certain type of content. I think in, in, in an archetypical scenario, the, the uh, quiet one in the back of the class might not mesh very well with a uh, in front of class presentation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. Well, but say, well, well, you, Marcus, when you, you uh, delivered your three minute presentation on, on Silco with that uh -huh. 20 minute prep, just kicked it out of the park, right? It's uh... <laughs> uh, so people mesh differently with different activities, very much so. And I think it's in saying that in, in where experience comes in is, is seeing a cohort because you can't cater to everyone. It doesn't work. Um, yeah. And seeing, okay, to this cohort, which activities will be most suited for most people? And having a little bit of a utilitarian approach. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> just going to comment a bit on that real quick. Uh, I think for me, it's um, uh, the pressure and the, the presentation. I used to have uh, stage fright, but uh, that, that completely swapped. So now I, I'm the opposite. Um, yeah. But speaking of stage fright, I mean, you're a teacher. Uh, what, what led you to become a lecturer at Nora? Uh, that is actually, uh, uh, again, animation happened to me. I didn't happen to it. Um, a little bit by random. Uh, so I'd known Paul in the past, and I was living in the UK at the time. And then just one Christmas morning, this was just, I think it was 17th or 18th of December, somewhere around that. <laughs> Uh, I got a message from Paul, like, hi, Eric, uh, long time no see. Do, do you know, can you or do you know anyone who uh, would be able to teach animation in Christiansand come January? And I don't know the specifics of what happened to my predecessor, but um, we very quickly needed an animation teacher in Christiansand uh, as soon as possible. Now, um, because you've been there, not the center of the world. <laughs> right. So finding finding someone, uh, if I'm finding a qualified person who would be willing to teach and uh, moving to Christensen was a bit of a tall order. <laughs> so so uh, so then it reached out to me, and and for me at the time I was living in the UK, and the UK is lovely. I have no problem with the UK. The only problem I have with the UK is that it's not very close to my family yeah and i really like my family so i want to i wanted to live closer to them i went like okay cardiff is nine hours away from oslo christian sign is four hours away from oslo and i don't have to fly fly on a, on a jet so let's uh move to christian sign then mm -hmm. and then when i moved the the idea was like oh yeah no i'm just gonna i'm gonna use use teaching as a springboard and then i'm gonna jump move to oslo do something else well, that 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 didn't didn't pan out the way I initially thought it would do. But <laughs> teaching is so much fun; I really enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, so uh, exactly on what you yeah. just said there. Like, it seems like when you get this emergency job, that your idea is that okay, I'm just going to do it until they find someone else. But what made you interested, or like, kept you engaged in this interactive media teaching course? Well, I mean, I think it's the interaction bit that is what made me engaged in it. Because I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to make games. <laughs> it was a huge I was going to make games. I was going to make become a game designer. And then, yeah, you too. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and and that again, the same with the drawing. It kind of fell on the wayside, uh, though notably with games, not because uh, I didn't know there was a job in it. I was scared by math. Mm. Because then my dad went, right, and he's, he's an IT architect, and he went, oh, but then you have to do math. Mm. I'm not going to mm. do games. <laughs> that was the initial response, right? Because <laughs> just like, math, math didn't click for me. And that, in hindsight, was a, it, it's a maturity thing, where at some point, when I was 20, it just snapped. I, just, I got that uh, epiphany. And I remember the line of code, computer code, that I saw 
that made me understand math. And I just had this, what's known as a Copernican revolution, where I just <laughs> suddenly understand everything. That one missing piece for every direction yeah. in your brain. Yeah. And, and this was, a, this was an, an animation expression. And uh, it goes like this. Um, we were describing, if you, if you hold your arm, you'll notice that if I twist my wrist around, my elbow stays in place, but my wrist flips over. And then we need to some way to describe how the skin uh, now kind of halfway twists. Mm -hmm. And the line of code read like this. Um, forearm joint one rotate X is equal to wrist uh, joint rotate X time 0 0.5. Which means that this joint in the middle of the arm, on humans, we have no joint in the animation, we do, will rotate half as much as the wrist. And then suddenly, that was the purest expression of linear algebra I have ever seen. So suddenly, just every single piece of functions, geometry, algebra, uh, just all clicked into place, because now I had a practical application of math. <laughs> and this yeah. is where actually this used to be a problem, not anymore, because now more people have caught on that math is too theoretical, and we need practical applications to see the value of it, at least yeah. to, to young children. But since then, now I now I love math. Now it's fun, mm -hmm. but I needed that one epiphany to go like. Oh wait, sorry, that was too too uh, quiet for the microphone to catch. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, it seems to like a lot with the, like maths and all that. Sometimes you need something visual to just get a grasp of what you're actually like calculating. It's not yeah, only just numbers, you know, and that's I mean, really like helpful. Yeah, and also that in in hindsight, right? Like my dad was wrong. Like you don't, you can absolutely work in game design and not doing math. That's totally fine. It's all the programmers <laughs> that, that need a lot of math. Would, on on because we are game students and you mentioned like game design and all that, would you like maybe in the future or something, or are you working on now maybe with Joshua or something? Would you be open to work on a game like like animation in video games or something in the future or uh, like? I mean, yes, and I do work uh, work that right now. Um, just outside outside of teaching, I occasionally do do gigs, freelance work. Yeah, I, I, I got to keep my skill sharps and stay in touch with industry as well. So, though, sadly, though, uh, given the time frame that I have available to me when I'm doing side jobs now, it's mostly just illustration work that I'm doing. Because uh, mm. if you start a full-on 3D character rig, for instance, which is what the other thing I could do would be, that takes months and months on end. Yeah, most people don't have the time or budget for that, right? So it's m mostly illustration work nowadays. So, and so. Like you said, you are you have some experience with being a freelancer. You just mentioned mm -hmm. that. Like, could you tell us a little bit about it? Like, just like for the animation students, or and as well for game students, because we some of us will be doing probably some freelance work. How is it? Is it like joyful? Do you like like it? Is it like funny Can't or bad? I say that I like it. I, I've only had good experiences working. In freelance, yeah. the time between, I don't like. Yeah. Now, I'm a little bit of an oddball in that respect, right? Because in a traditional sense, uh, you you need you need to have a strong online presence. You need to have a strong online portfolio. I'm sure you've done your research. There's very little of me online. <laughs> yeah. And and that's a little bit by choice. I don't I don't have a very huge online footprint at all. So most of my freelance work goes word word of mouth. And the reason for this is that I've been incredibly lucky. I started mm -hmm. working in NRK, that's the Norwegian broadcast, uh, television broadcast, when I was mm -hmm. 15. And that's purely through connections. There wasn't anything pro pro prodigal with me. And my job was to tidy and pull wires. Mm -hmm. And then as, as it happens, right, since, since NRK is a, is a government program, right, it's, it's a, it's a um, public position, then uh, they have more rules to what they need to do and not do. So if they can train internally, they will do that before they hire from outside. 
So they started giving giving uh, more courses to their uh, to their uh, assistants, and they have a whole pipeline. They bring you on as an assistant. Your job is to pull wires, and then they give you a course, and then they give you more courses, then they give you more courses, and then I don't know if this is exactly true or if it's a myth, but apparently, a a photographer uh, f- walked off a pier during a filming, and he wasn't able to get his camera harness off. Because when you're working something that's known as a steady cam, um, that is a huge camera harm that is attached to an arm that is attached to a harness. If any one of you watched uh, um, uh, one of the alien films where they walk around with guns attached to a arm, that's an act. That's an actual camera rig. Literally, the camera rig we're we're talking about. They just attach guns to it instead of the camera. <laughs> Prop guns. Uh, so, but he couldn't get that off in time. So sadly, this photographer drowned. At which point it became a requirement that uh, all uh, Steadicam photographers outside the studio uh, required a dedicated assistant to them. Mm-hmm. So uh, the whole lot got trained in, in how to operate those cameras and how to uh, operate those kinds of productions. And then there's a whole lot more gigs available to you because then it was a requirement that these photographers had an assistant to them. So me then working as a freelancer, that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. So much, a lot of work, very, very fun. I don't like the hours in television, but it was good work. Yeah. yeah. Though, but here comes where to work into routing this back to the animation, right? Is that I don't need to put myself out there as much when I already have an RK on the resume because that becomes a seal of approval, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, what, um, what qualifications do you have? No, I've been working here for the past four years. And they go, oh, that's really good. Then you must be really good. And they just take it on faith. Yeah. And I don't let them down, luckily, but but the, this is the thing, right? So I already, for me, that snowball is already rolling. Mm-hmm. People know of me, and more importantly, the people that give out work know who I am. Yeah. yeah. So I every now and then get contacted by real estate uh, visualization in Norway going, hey, are you still teaching at Norof? I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, let us know when you're not. <laughs> I don't have any plans on jumping into real estate because that seems uh, dull. But <laughs> the the uh, the thing is there. So the same way with now working in in Norof, right? I have now both NRK and Norof on my resume, which again that's a double seal of approval. So now it's mm-hmm. very easy for me to pick up freelance work and go, yeah, now I can do that. Would you say because... ask if they can see some of my work, and I'll give them some of my work. But. Would you say being a lecturer at Norov has helped you, um, like being a freelancer, like uh, like uh, opens up like more people hear of you because like students graduate and then maybe they start talking and everyone would probably recommend Eric Hammer from school, like the like the his teacher. Theory, our teacher, yeah. Yeah, no, that that actually hasn't happened uh, that way. It's been the other way around, actually. Te- my previous teachers have recommended me um, mm-hmm. for for various gigs because um, they know they know of me, and then they see that I'm working at now that I'm working at Norof, and then they go, yeah, no, he, he's he was really good. Now he must now he must be very good. You should reach out to him. Um, <laughs> but uh, because like if if. I don't know. I I don't think I'd be comfortable with my own students recommending me to do work. Not because I wouldn't be happy about that. I would very much be happy. And sure, I'd do the work. But it seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? <laughs> One of my principal duties is to make sure that you guys are employable, right? Yeah. So I'd be kind of counterproductive for me to then also soak up the jobs that are. I find that a little yeah. bit... Um, a little bit selfish, perhaps, especially now that I, I don't really need the work. I, I am very content with the job that I already do. Yeah. Have you recommended students yourself? Yes, I do. Every year. There mm-hmm. are a select few that uh, <laughs> I would recommend. And most of them do end up with a job. For those who are listening, like, try to impress their cameras <laughs> well, and you will get a job. Yes. <laughs> no, uh, were any? Yeah, sorry, go on. Were any like uh, 
do you have any like projects at the top of, of your head like uh like on your mind that are re has really uh, are really exciting projects that you have worked on as a freelancer as i have worked on as a freelancer <sighs> yeah well most of these things are are very often in-house but i think one of the one of the freelance jobs that i did that sticks with me because I, I, it, I appreciated it so was that I was animating a Christmas card. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was a simple job. Uh, it was for nursing students and uh, they had originally contracted a commercial company called Dynamo. Yeah. And then they, I assume they had uh, overscoped a project. So they did, suddenly didn't have their regular staff available. Yeah. So then they reached out to me and was like, hey, can you do this job? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do the job. It was a simple gig. It was, uh, I, they gave me an image and then they told me, we need the stars to twinkle. So I sit for the next two days masking out stars in After Effects individually. <laughs> that was a long, long day. <laughs> Make these to twinkle at various different keys to go like so that they wouldn't, you know, shine at the same time and create this yeah. natural starry sky look. Um, it was a very Christian endeavor because this was in 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 Bethlehem over the uh, over the cradle. But mm -hmm. I don't know. It's one of my it's one of my first. I think was my first actual uh, freelance job as an animator, which is why it just sticks with me. And then they were really happy. And then they they just asked me a question like, "What's your rate?" It was my first gig. I I had no clue what my rate was, so I'm like, "Yeah, what would you pay your regular animators at the time?" <laughs> <laughs> and then they went, oh, no, we'll, we'll pay them this. I'm like, cool, I'll take that. How would you, like, on that, like, just for those who want to become a freelancer, I, mean, I don't, I haven't done any, like, freelance work. How do you, like, so, pretty weird question, isn't it, to answer for maybe the first gig you do, like, first, like, freelancer work, like, like, what's your rate? And you're like, I don't know, I'm just a newly graduated student from North, uh, maybe... 10 bucks or something and <laughs> yeah, no i think pricing pricing yourself right is that um there there are a lot of facets to this i think the first one being is that it's it's always a bit of a wordless negotiation like i i envision it like you know two two cowboys at noon and, yeah. and they're both going and are ready to pull what's your rate and what's your budget yeah. And the first guy to ask, right? That's the, that's always a a point of tension. The second facet is that if you price yourself too low, lower than what would be considered competitive, you're actually hurting not just yourself but the entire field, right? You are mm -hmm. undercutting the value of animation. So yeah, yeah, yeah. not only will can you then also not expect to be paid more in the future, but you're also devaluing the work of your colleagues or co-animators in the lack of a better term so yeah you have that aspect as well and then thirdly like you also need to live and how much do you value your time mm -hmm. so my two best advice there is to first remember that just because you're speaking to a person because this is normally done verbally over the phone or otherwise it's mm -hmm. not their money you are using. It's their company. It is their uh, grant. It is their forward money. It's their loan. It's not their money, not, not their personal anyway. You can mm -hmm. do smaller commission for like D&D &D characters and whatnot. And that, yeah, sure, then that's private money. But then it's also not a lot of money usually. Mm -hmm. But that, So I remind myself of that. And then I, I, I try to make a guess. How much money do they have? Mm -hmm. And so if a private person asks me to do something for them, like make them a sculpt or make them a, a portrait or a D&D character, or uh, if I can create a 2D rig for a drawing they already have, I usually price that work a whole lot less than if a company came to me and gave me the same thing, i.e. with, with the animated Christmas card. Mm -hmm. If a, a friend of me came to me, hey, can you animate a Christmas card? I want it like this. And I said, yeah, well, what's your rate? Uh, six pack. <laughs> but then in the case of, of the of the uh, company, right? I know this is a this is a large production house. 
they have a lot mm -hmm. of money. So now I can shoot for the stars with, with the rate. Yeah. That's how we usually go. And then form a baseline, right? How what, ba What's your baseline rate? And it mm -hmm. could be, okay, uh, is it 1,000 per day, 2,000 per day, 3,000 per day? Right? What's the baseline? So if this piece of work takes a day, then say, okay, I'm going to take at least 2,000. Or if yeah. it takes two days, then that's at least 2,000. If it takes a week, that's 14,000. Because mm -hmm. what you have to remember, unlike a, a full-time job, right, where you know you're going to get a salary at the end of every month, yeah, you don't know when the next gig's going to come. So you actually have to overprice yourself a little bit so that you have something to live on. Yeah. For the next until the next gig comes up. And this is also where you can be a little bit more more open, right? If you know you have multiple gigs, if you have mm -hmm. so much commission work that you actually can't keep up. Mm -hmm. Oh, your price a bit. And this is the backwards order of freelance work, right? Because the supply and demand is a little bit flipped where where uh if you lower your prices, you're going to get more supply, more demand, but you can't do that unless you already have the demand, at which point you can raise your price again, and then it, becomes, it flips the entire uh, script around. And that whole pressure and the old need to advertise yourself, don't like it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like it at all. It's like, a, would you say it's like a confidence thing? It's like uh, we were talking in, um, it's a, a course in games called Digital Forensics. Uh, I think it's like conceptualization, actually. It's like our project was yeah, named. Yeah, now, now I remember which, which uh, project you're on about. Yeah, and that's like fake. Like it's a safe environment to freelance work, basically. Mm -hmm. And Paul um, is teaching that course. And there was like this one assignment for us to evaluate our work. And I said, like, I just started like, saying like because i'm just a student uh so like 25 dollars maybe like 20 dollars because i don't have any experience and like this bit more above like minimum wage here in iceland you know mm -hmm. and he said like no you need to have more confidence you, you can like double that definitely if, if you're yeah. making a game from st uh, like scratch like for a month like just you need to double like maybe triple it dude. like you need to have much more confidence man and i was yeah. like oh is that so damn good point so like would you say it's like like a confidence thing maybe just over scope and be open to negotiate if somebody wants to maybe lower the price but uh, certainly i mean it is a confidence thing and but and also just because you overpriced doesn't mean you're not going to get the job. You're going to get the, hey, sorry, we can't afford that. Can you go lower? Yeah. Because they're already in contact with you, right? And remember this, like, um, I, I don't know uh, about YouTube, but I, I'm sure a lot of people listening, right? They will find it uncomfortable to approach new people. Yeah. That's a very universal human experience. Same yeah. thing yeah. for show. Sure. They've already approached you. They are talking to you. They want you. And if they don't really want you, they definitely don't want to talk to someone else because that's, again, just a, a more effort. So mm -hmm. if they could rather have you for a lower cost, have that negotiation go a little bit on longer, they'll do that. Mm -hmm. we, we need to get away from this idea that there's a blacklist, right? Where yeah. if you gave them your show reel, they're never going to look at it again. Or if you over budgeted once, they're never going to contact you again. Mm, they're not. No one spends the time to keep track of that. Right. It's like the imposter syndrome thing, I guess, or something like that. It's like you yeah. are, we are like, uh, because we are like designers, artists, really like creative persons, and we have this thing that we are pretty scared of being, like you said, blacklisted, being like forgotten, or like our job or like design isn't valued in, as much. But in like, when I show my friends that I, aren't in animation or games, they are always like, whoa, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, it's a, uh, it's a, I opened up just Unity and uh, like worked on some color palettes and some shaders and I did some coding and yeah, it's like a perspective of the camera and they were like, well, how did you like, we, we are like, I think we need to value ourselves much better than we think. Yeah. We do. And I think, and that is, I think it always helps to have a little bit of perspective there because you can get quite isolated in this whole 3D bubble. 
yeah. where you only speak to people, like-minded people, where and they have similar skills to you. They know how you did it, so it's less impressive, and they and it feeds into this ability that what you cannot, what you can do, isn't special. Yeah. Then you have to remember that there are all what almost eight billion people on the planet right now. Yeah. I don't know the exact number, but you're probably in the top billion artists in the world. Right? Yes. Yay. Top billion. <laughs> Woo! Take that to heart. That means that there are seven billion other people that aren't as good at this as you are. That's True. a pretty valuable skill then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Because like we humans are a pack animal, a super pack animal. We live in packs of hundred tens of millions of people at times, right? But major cities. And it's not the case that one job is more important than the other. I mean, this is what everyone learned during COVID that shit. Society doesn't run without these particular low skill jobs that are paid. Suddenly they mm-hmm. realized, oh, there is an importance hierarchy to jobs. At least it came to public consciousness. Uh, and uh, those sadly are a bit underpaid while mm-hmm. say stuff that we do, which isn't as immediately critical. We are usually very well paid, handsomely paid, and we could all work from comfortable home offices. But to bring it back to, to the to the imposter syndrome thing is that just because your work isn't immediately valuable to the people around you, again with a bubble, means that there are seven other billion people who will value the work. They might not be able to pay you for it or need it, but they will value it. Yeah. And that I think is important to know. And also take time. To, to show your work to pe- to your friends that don't do what you do, mm-hmm. don't, that don't do games. They will go, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And that helps with the imposter syndrome. Yeah. I, I, I think that, like, helped me when I, like, when I got imposter to show my friends what I'm doing. Because, like, I get, I have this perfectionism, so it's like, I get too to like the smallest detail and like I like don't like when I do something wrong sometimes. So yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, be- before we go into the next question, um, how you have you like worked like uh, around the like globe? Like we talked to Felipe. He's like a nomad lecturer he's like everywhere uh, it mm. seems like like in britain in portugal and like i say with diego he has but i uh, not he has been he hasn't been like teaching in many places on diego maybe but he has like been in germany and france and everything how about you Where, have you traveled a lot no all the way around i lived in the uk but even when i lived in the uk i traveled back to norway to work so I had I had gigs where where I spent uh, the same amount of money on on travel expenses as I did actually earning money on that gig, but that was just to keep my foot in the door while while I was uh, living in the UK. Mm-hmm. So no, I'm the polar opposite. Uh, my all of my work is domestic, but it also says that that I am the the youngest guy on the team by a significant margin. So, so uh, I I haven't lived for long enough yet to really rack up that international experience. I'm gonna I'm would gonna believe in age. Would you like to like go to Australia or like something like drastic in the future? Is that something you would like to do? Yes, but also no. And I think it's about the stage of life I'm in right now. Like now. I I don't dream of of working cool gigs in New Zealand. At least not mm-hmm. anymore. Now I dream of like buying a house, settling down, raising a family. That's that's where I am now. Yeah. So, and that runs kind of counter to like moving to Australia and doing a film yeah. shoot in Brisbane. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, like, even though you're saying that you haven't like done a lot of traveling and working uh, outside of Norway, you have worked on some big things. Uh, yeah, we did I, find out that you've been working on your vision. Uh, and a Nobel Peace Prize concert. Yeah. Um, I mean, can you can you explain a bit about what what was like working on something that's you know uh, a, a cultural thing? 
Um, so this, yeah, no, this was television work, uh, and uh, and uh, this is the point where I, I'd done it for a couple of years, right? As I mentioned, like they were racking up up uh, up uh, courses. So then it was working in television at that point because it's all filmed live, mm -hmm. and that is always scary because you you have a you have a, a plan, you have a project that says says where all the shots are going to be. And it's going to be a wide shot. It's going to be extreme close up, and you can go through this plan because you need to make sure all the cameras can film. Now, the photographers, right? They have a viewfinder, so they can see. I cannot, so I have to imagine it. <laughs> I have to know where the cameras are. And I remember one of the productions. I think it was the Eurovision. Uh, no, it was a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, where I open open the the the, the shot list. And it goes the, the the camera seven and camera nine, camera five, which I had the time. It's just ad lib, ad lib, ad lib, ad lib. Ad lib means at liberty, which also means whatever the photographer thinks of is cool at the time. <laughs> now, my responsibility there was to make sure that they could film, and uh, make sure that they were in the right spot at the right time. So we need to then have some ESP going in. So either I either I need to read their mind, mm -hmm. or you need to develop a sense about what creates a good picture, a good frame, good good television. Quite frankly, frankly, right. So you could have a good guess about where the photographer is going to be. And at this point, right, I'd been working with a lot of them for a lot, for a long time, so I knew what they were going to do. At which point, it was very fascinating just to see how this entire production of uh, what 25 people uh just in the television crew or uh, the photography crew alone all worked in almost wordless conjunction mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to get uh, get uh, a television show to work because what you have like you have you have radios and you and speakers and you can communicate uh and in that you have what's an entity known as camera control that is almost like the director uh, that will direct which cameras are on live right now and which cameras are are going where. Because what you don't see when you're watching television at home, right, is that all the cameras are filming all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, you have a a a, a director, an overmind, sitting in the bus, flopping in between which cameras are live and which cameras are not. And then mm -hmm. we go, okay, cool, camera seven, you're on. Camera five, you're on. Camera nine, move to position B and film and. So they move right uh, on to keep the production going. So, mm -hmm. no, and, and I think the second thing that I got from working at uh, Nobel Peace Prize was how much practice goes into actually performing a thing. This goes back to a little bit when, when you have presentations for me, and what I see is that a lot of the time when you hold a presentation, this is the first time you've actually held that presentation. I go, no, no. In, te in live television, we run through the show three or four times before we run it, and that's after we have had several days of testing each number, getting the lights right, getting the frame right, getting the camera moves right, getting the sound right, and we have this massive production of, yeah. of uh, people. So, I think my biggest takeaway for actually my television days, just in general, was just how much effort quality requires, due diligence, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like different now that you worked on something massive or do you feel like it was just like part of your life? Because this is like something maybe out of reach before, but now it's like you've done it. Yeah, now I've done it. So now, yeah, no, I feel different. Uh, world feels a lot smaller, actually, because now when <laughs> I see a massive television show, I go, yeah, I, I, I know. I, I know not only do I know how they do that, but if it's in Norway, I probably know who did that. <laughs> and then I go, well, that, not that hard. Um, so no, the uh, no, I think the the uh, weirdest thing I've done out of all the things I've done in television, I've, I've worked on multiple uh, Eurovision uh, projects, but the scariest one that I had this was this was actually relatively early because uh, I was. Um, there's a there's a panel because so the, the people that counsel the votes sit in a completely yeah, yeah. different part of the venue than where the speakers were. Yeah. And so when the winner they they know who the winner is, 
We'll print that out on a piece of note. And then we need to get that over to the other side of the venue. <laughs> now, there's only one way to the other, other side of the venue, and mm -hmm. that's through the, the audience area. Mm -hmm. So when I had that note, I, I had to then run across the entire audience. And there are 3,000 people in there. I don't re exactly remember how many people Spectrum seats at the moment, but it was packed. <laughs> no one must know that I had the winner. So when I was like, when I was darting through, you'd have people realize that it was me because you're like, it's the same people that produce your vision every year, same photographers, same journalists, same everyone. So then they realize like, oh, that's the guy. <laughs> and then I had to <laughs> dodge past these people. <laughs> and I was like, this is not in my job description. No <laughs> 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 note with two names <laughs> on it uh, to get the winner. No, no, no. Yeah, that's the sort of thing in television. So, but, but it's because of those things, right? Because like, you come in the realities of production, everything's run smoothly, and then they realize, oh, we have no way of getting the information from this part of the venue to the other part of the venue. There is no radio between these two people. Oh my goodness! <laughs> right, and then suddenly you find a critical failure, and and this is the this is the lovely part, right? Where, is that it doesn't matter where you are on the food chain, mm -hmm. right? A job's a job. It needs to be done. Do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> How, uh, like, first of all, do you like, this was Eurovision, yeah? Yeah. I do like Eurovision, just uh, like off topic. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Eurovision is fantastic. <laughs> How is it like working and producing? You like, do you enjoy the concert? Why, whilst you like doing your thing? So, you like... I mean, when when you are working in it, right? You you can't really watch the show. Um, you can watch some of the production tests, but mm -hmm. um, when you're in it and when you're live, like your nerves are through the roof because yeah. any any fuck up that you will do will be seen by a million people. And yeah. will be recorded forever. <laughs> yes. I have been on television several times. And every single time, I should not have been there. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm on television, I've felt. So, <laughs> so, so you sit there, at which point you are in your bubble. You have one thing that you need to do. And just everything is secondary to that. And so, mm -hmm. no, you, you don't really get to... It's a very different experience working on a pro on a thing like that as uh, as opposed to seeing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, speak uh, like could could you give any tips for people from our courses who maybe wants to work in TV in some way? Uh, do you think there's yeah. like a path there? Um, not directly, uh, and the reason being is that um, there are some traditional lines that you go. So most of the people just say working at NRK, they have a a uh, camera tech degree from Lillehammer. And that's usually where they go and hire first. But it's a public position, so there are a lot more rules to how they can hire, which means there's always been in. Um, apart from that, a lot of the supers, which is when you ever see graphics on screen, they are usually um, bought in from external companies. So you wouldn't, to work in television like that, you wouldn't necessarily work for NRK. That's not where you'd go. Then you'd go to, say, uh, JPC or Dynamo or a Monster or a similar production houses that will actually do that and sell their services mm -hmm. to NRK, which is, which is how, which jumpstart my um, freelance, right? Because then working television doesn't immediately translate to, to animation apart from camera moves. So, so, but then I already had a freelance company working television and I was doing animation. So I'm like, yeah, no, I can do animation gigs as well. And mm -hmm. then didn't made, need to make a new company or anything. And then people just assumed that, uh, oh, but yeah, he's working in RK. He knows this stuff. And uh, I go, yeah, but that's completely unrelated. <laughs> but that jump started the, again with the seal of quality, right? That jump started my freelance career. And then... A couple of years later, now I have done both animation gigs, TV gigs, film gigs, some game gigs, though they didn't fly, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, what, uh, like, after doing some digging, this will be like, this is my favorite question, probably, because I, I'm like, work there right now. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So after doing some digging on like LinkedIn, I like went over like your like degrees and like what you've like learned and everything mm-hmm. and there was one, one funny bit uh that i like haven't seen on like diego's linkedin page or joshua it was um uh, i found out that you worked as a barista or a bartender uh yeah. but, like, i have could you do you could you tell us a little bit just because it's a totally off topic? It's just a funny question because I would l- probably lots of students are working as a barista or a bartender at mm-hmm. a cafe. Or something. What is your like favorite drink, cocktail, cafe or something? Ooh, like, well, I mean, those are two very different things where if you're a cafe or, or a bar, but <laughs> um, let's do them at, at a cafe. My favorite drink is a cappuccino. Cappuccino. Yeah. Yes, but then that's the but that's all, then I also have to like that's how I qualify whether or not this is a good, uh, good cafe or not because you have to get the coffee right, and you have to get the milk right, and you're supposed to drink the milk through the coffee. Sorry, all the way around, coffee through the milk. <laughs> um, so that's generally not the one I order because when I order coffee, I go for bulk, so I go for the largest latte they have usually. <laughs> because I I I value quantity over quality in most cases. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I go for large. So my favorite is cappuccino, but the one I b- most frequently buy is a large quantity of warm caffeinated milk. That's <laughs> what I buy. Now, as far as as far as cocktails concerned, I I think my favorite cocktail it varies a little bit with the seasons, but I think it would be a Leonard. Leonard, what's that? Leonard. Uh, it's a it's a cocktail that's based on a pear liquor, mm-hmm. so it has a very distinct pear taste, and I really enjoy it. Partly because I'm allergic to pear, so I can't have it in its natural form. But uh, so so uh, <laughs> this particular cocktail is as close as I get. And outside of that, I think this perhaps merges the bartender and the barista in me. A good white Russian is also a very very good Ooh. thing. White Russian is like ah, uh, that's my favorite during the winter. Like. Going yeah. ski trips and then going to the bar and like oh yeah, white Russian oof. Such a good, such a good cool. How about you, Marcus? Any favorite drinks? Uh, I like to stick to hot chocolate when I'm at a cafe, and uh, it's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I know several ways you can spice that up. Yeah, <laughs> there's no, like I've a... tried a few things, but uh, I like to stick to sugar. It's my high. Yeah, no, you should right. try, you should try have some amaretto in it there uh, one time. <laughs> it's an almond liquor, which is really, really good in chocolate. Yeah, yeah I have, I actually have it right here. Uh-oh. <laughs> I think that you were talking about this one here, but maybe a different version. Yeah, no, no, that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> this really, is really good with, with the cream and chocolate. This is like one of my favorite liquor. So good, especially yeah. apple, uh, like orange juice. It's like, oh, I haven't tried that actually. Yeah, it's like candy. It's not you don't feel any like alcohol taste or anything. It's like fantastic. But anyway, let's go back to more serious topics. Like before people go to sleep again. Like before becoming a lecturer, uh, working a lot, lot within the interactive media landscape. Mm-hmm. Were there any experience that in, influenced you to try to become who you are today? Uh, you mentioned Frozen yeah. as a like great, like uh, inspirational, like thing that pushed you. Were there any other experience that helped you become this wizard? You uh, who you are right now? Yes, there was. There were. I think there were were three three uh, key people who who influenced me quite a bit into into. Uh, show or becoming who I am. One accident and two people, I think, is perhaps a better way of phrasing it. Uh, the first one, his name is David Beer, it's the guy who taught me how to animate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, he works at Kristen today. So, because I remember I'd, I I came to him and he asked me like like what do what do you aspire to be? What do you want to do? What do you want to what do you want to do with your animation? And I said, I want to be the next Walt Disney because I was I was 20 and I was cocky. I was, that was an absolute idiot. <laughs> and I sat there and then this this was my this was my uh, my uh, shtick. 
And then he just looked me dead faced. Yeah, I don't so I don't hope you send as many children to sweatshops as he did. <laughs> oh, no. And then he pointed to like all of his like various small toys he had playing around. And that was such a rude wake up call. Like holy <laughs> when, when when I went in there all starry and go like, oh my god, I've gotta do this thing. I was like, no, you're an idiot. <laughs> Disney isn't built on great films. It's built on toys made in sweatshops in Southeast Asia. Yeah. And, and so I mean it wasn't it wasn't to call out Disney in particular, it was to call out the entire Hollywood industry. But the the but the idea was there that that be careful what you wish for because your dreams like don't don't meet your your heroes. It's not it's not a good idea. Um Especially not all the way. And that and that made me critically reflect a whole lot more about what I do and why. About mm -hmm. what, what animation is for. Because up until that point, excuse me, for me, animation had just been, oh, it's a fun entertainment thing. I can make pretty pictures and I can make a move. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's fun. And then I started to realize, oh no, animation is a medium. And you can you can convey a message in it you can and that message might be cool enjoy this is entertaining and i think that's fine i don't think anything needs to be so drenched in meaning that you can write a thesis on every episode of it i don't think that's necessary but it made me think in those certain ways which is why perhaps today semiotics is one of my favorite things to talk about <laughs> uh so he was a great a great influence on me and of course taught me how to animate so Clearly, he would be the, the biggest influence of who I am today professionally. No, and, and, and the second one was actually a guy I studied with. Uh, he is now a senior uh, environment lead at the CD Projekt Red. Because he was an older guy at the time. He was 30 when I started studying. And he was the one who gave me a little bit of reality, right? Where it doesn't matter how old you are when you start to get your degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy, he had been working not in, he had been making mods for Skyrim and whatnot for a long time. So he had a lot of experience, <laughs> not just not necessarily the professional kind. Yeah. But yeah. It, companies don't care too much as long as you can do what you can do and you have some experience, right? So he, so he shows up there. He does some amazing work. But the humility of the guy, he, he knew about just about everything. Because then when you start in a 3D degree, you're doing absolute basics. So you're learning what a vertice is and how to vertices make an edge. And then he sits and he's been doing this for 10 years. But he showed up every single day, did all the work. And when once he had done the minimum of the work, then he made it his own. And he pushed yeah. it forward and forward and forward. And he sat uh, having good professional conversations with a lecturer every, every day. And just being in that environment rubbed so much off on me of, of, of just how this thing works. Mm -hmm. So he was also very, very good, great and a very good friend as well. Um, so, uh, no, he was a very, very good influence uh, on, on showing up and just the fact that he was so much older really mm -hmm. put them in perspective that we're not athletes. We don't, yeah. we don't have to be 20 to do this. Mm -hmm. We can be 40. We can be 50. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last one was a bit of an accident. So my specialty is, well, my specialty now is teaching, I suppose, since I've been doing teaching more than I've done anything else combined. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, my specialty was rigging, not animation. I'm a rigging wizard, actually, or, or perhaps I'm an animation wizard. If, but if I'm, an, if I'm an animation wizard, then I'm a rigging arch wizard. I'm going to put it that way. Uh, and I kind of happened, did that by accident. So... I have a compulsive need for people to like me. All right. I don't, I, I will, I'm a very agreeable person. I will never be the guy that go, oh my God, that guy was such a f If you say that to me, I will go lay down in the street and hope for the next bus to come, right? Like, I, I can't, I can't deal with people not liking me. So what happened, right, is that I had, I had um, moved to the UK and I knew a bunch of people and they wanted to do an animated short. And then they needed riggers because like no one does rigging. No one likes the rigging. Everyone just finds this. Either they hate it because they know what it is, or they find they hate it and find it scary because they don't know what it is. A lot mm -hmm. of xenophobia <laughs> and rigging. Everyone hates it because they don't know it. <laughs> um, me having the compulsive need to be liked by people went, I, I can I can rig it. 
And that started my rigging specialism because it was the one thing that no one else wanted to do. And I wanted to, I sought that approval. So that's how I become the grandmaster of rigging. Yeah, sure <laughs> had nothing to do with the field itself, had everything to do with, with the people around it. Of course, I do enjoy rigging. I wouldn't have kept with it if I didn't like it. But that's that's where it started. It didn't start with a burning passion for the project. It started with, uh, I need people to like me, so therefore I'm going to put the joints in this monkey. What do you, <laughs> what do you say uh, to like your students when they're like, when you're teaching re rigging to like, because when we like me and Marcus are creating games, as soon as something like a topic about rigging animation or something like that, we like, like drive away from that. Like, <laughs> let's not do that. Like we are scared of just the word rigging. Um, so what do you like? Because you are saying people are scared because they don't know it. And uh, like, do, so do you have any advice? I do. Or, I have a lot of advice there, actually. So what I do is that I try to dispel the fear that mm -hmm. that rigging is this extremely complicated thing. Because it is. But you have a, a quite large margin of error in rigging, where if you just chuck some joints in there and do a, a just a simple bind skin, it'll work. Mm -hmm. It won't be the best, and um, it won't be to a professional standard, but if your like, gig minion in the game is just need to like wobble back and forth until he explodes on you, like that, that's sufficient. It's perfectly fine. So that's the first thing I do, is to just don't, don't overscope your rigging projects. I don't, I don't know who says this, but there's a saying that goes, um, normal people go, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Engineers go, if it ain't broke, it doesn't have enough features yet. <laughs> and so the truth is always true for rigging is that, yeah, okay, I, I'm going to need my arms, right? Yeah, they can squash and they can stretch and they can do all these kind of things. But then I go, well, are, is your character going to do that? No, he's, he's going to run back and forth. Cool. So you, you don't need your arms to squash and stretch then, do you? <laughs> I, I, try to, I try to limit the field a little bit of going like, no, no, this is actually not that scary. I tried to point out the fact that, that this is quite fun. I think the real reason why a lot of people shy away from it is that it isn't creative enough. Like you don't have a lot of room for creative expression. Mm -hmm. I don't find that to be the case, but I've also done it enough that I can be creative in how my approach to say rigging an arm, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I'm creating creative in my problem solving, but not creative in an expressive kind of way. So I think yeah. that's where also a lot of people lose interest. And once you've lost interest, rigging is too too complicated to, to catch on. Not because yeah. you don't yeah. have the cognitive capacity to do it, but it's just not going to stick if you're not interested mm -hmm. in it. Which is why I think rigging is a little bit of personality-based. I love yeah. hard science. I like math. I like chemistry. I like biology. I like programming, hard answers, which is also why love rigging where like yeah it works or it doesn't it's fine <laughs> um, yeah. so you uh, have talked to, like in the beginning about uh like like what you teach you know, mentioned some courses uh during the first year and second year could you give us because we are like game students and maybe students that are applying for norov and are watching this like hey it comes yeah. Eric Hammer is maybe going to teach me, like, could you give us, like, what will the student learn within your courses? Give us a little yeah. bit of different styles of animation, maybe, or... Well, uh, actually, yeah, no, I can't do that. We're not... We don't actually explore that many different styles of animation in my courses. Um, I teach most of the first-year courses, which means that it's it's the introductory courses that I normally teach, where you get to the you know the ideas of what's a key, what's a keyframe, what's a breakdown, like how an actual animation is built. Mm -hmm. And in that, there is some physics. You will start to learn like what to make bounds properly work, how to make uh, the physiology of the world walk actually work. So there's a lot of underlying principles mm -hmm. that you will have to have nailed down before you can really explore styles. Mm -hmm. right? It becomes the same same idea, right? Of say when you're drawing a character, is the, is it stylized anatomy or just bad at drawing? 
The same thing in animation as well, where, oh, is this a particular animated style, or do you just don't know quite how legs work? <laughs> <laughs> same thing could absolutely happen. So, so you do... We do spend a lot of time doing doing uh, animation, just animation activities. So we we make sure that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, you will also get a good grasp of basics of three D of like creating creating assets, and and learning how to move them, light them, texture them. I think so. If I were to explain something, if you want an artifact at the end of my courses that you can make, imagine just. Oh, this is going to be contentious. Imagine a loot box. <laughs> and uh -huh. all the animations you need to make this loot box like appear and shake and open up and stuff flying out. Woo! That's usually where you end up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After the first year of animation with me. And then second year, then we go into a lot deeper into how characters move. And then, then I get very excited about rigging because then we can talk about like joint articulation in hands and again way too deep into inverse kinematics and we can I, I talk at great length and while no one is listening uh, about what we do in rigging but to summarize it in a more fun way you learn actually how to make a person move and that's when mm -hmm. you feel really empowered in this field because as you've mentioned previously the minute just the rigging shows up as a field you guys just got no no can't do that close it bye do something else <laughs> you come you overcome that hurdle yeah and that tickles a particular kind of god plug god complex i find where you can go like i can make everything now the world is my oyster so once you have that the rigging down i'm learning how to make a character move because this is the thing right animators move characters riggers make them a move we can now you can now move them and there's very there's a lot of instant gratification in that then you move over to animation too at least as it stands right now. New people that come onto your course, this might have changed by then. But mm -hmm. uh, then you learn a lot more about game animation. Talking about animated cycles, like what makes a walk cycle, and then you blend that into a run, and then you can blend that into a crouch if you hold control, and then suddenly you get this interplay between small animations and player input. Mm -hmm. And there's some, game, there's some talk about game design there as well. Like what's the... Why must a uh, enemy attack have so much more anticipation? That is what happens before the animation, as opposed to the the hero character, right? Who has no anticipation at all. The animation just happens. And mm -hmm. we, there are a lot of ideas in planning as well that we'll start discussing them as as just as you are putting this into a game engine. So mm -hmm. I think at the end of a second year with me, you'd be able to like make a full on three D platformer. Say like put Spyro as an example or Crash Bandicoot. Mm -hmm. That's usually the way the level level set. Yeah, and beyond that, uh, third year, that's not my bag. Uh, mm -hmm. I can I can show you where the extrude button is, but then third year, then 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 you talk with the with the industry veterans like John Klima and Eric Gesslin and Philippe. There you're there, then you're in their their ballpark. Do do like students need to have any past experience before like applying, or is it just completely for beginner? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no past experience required. The better you are at, at be it modeling, drawing, rigging, I, that's a poor example. Uh, but the better you are at, at 3D, the better you're going to do. Yeah. And I will, I will tailor the difficulty level. So it's not the case that if you have a lot of experience and you show up in my class, you're going to be bored because I will make it harder for you in, in a good way. Um, <laughs> But uh, beyond that, it, I think a good benchmark, if you like to draw or you like math, you're going to be fine in interactive media uh, or, or in game design in general. If you don't like yeah. either of those two things, you might struggle a bit. Mm -hmm. And I would, that's what I would take to heart. And obviously, you have to like games, but like liking to play games is not the same as liking to make games, two very different beasts. Yeah. So check check with yourself. You don't need prior experience. Not needed at all. But if you can actually sit down and enjoy drawing stickman, or you don't dread the idea of no of having to do a sine wave, then then you'd be good. Then you have the temperament for it. Yeah. So so at the end of this bachelor, bachelor of, of interactive media for 
uh, animation specifically, will they have the tools to become a animation witches or wizards? Yes, they will. Though I will say they will still be novices. But just mm. to follow that uh, analogy, or perhaps an apprentice at that point. And this is because <laughs> the 10,000 hour will apply a little bit, right? Where, yeah, okay, you have your degree, you know your stuff, and you're qualified, but you haven't practiced it for, for eight hours a day, five days a week, for five years. Mm. It's impossible yeah. to do that with an MBA. Uh, mm -hmm. while, while every other, every other artist-led field, that's mm. a given. And this is something that's lost on the visual arts field for some reason, because I compared a lot more to an instrument mm -hmm. where, where the music industry is full on a board with, you have to have practice playing piano for a whole bunch of hours before you can do anything with it. In visual arts, and this is, this is a, a industry spanning thing. This isn't a unique thing to us. Uh, we've put the cart before the horse a little bit. So you get your qualifications and then you, okay, now go practice. <laughs> which i always think is a bit backwards but that's the field we're in and that might change that that might change yeah. i uh, it's so funny yeah marcus no i was just gonna say like it, it reminds me a bit of the the harry potter uh when harry potter starts training all the wizards for uh the fight the war against the 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 school um yeah. with, with the new spells and everyone's like a novice even though they've been going to school just as long as harry potter um, yeah. So this kind of is because of the wishes of wizards, you know. Uh, I was like thinking mm -hmm. of that. Um, but uh, moving a bit uh, into like the, I guess how how the courses uh, feel because uh, in the first year we're obviously having Studio One with with animation as, as game students. But do do the animation students and the game students kind of blend together, uh, cohort? Like do they do they spend a lot of time together and do they have courses together? So that's actually re changed recently from what you two experienced. So now um, we uh, are in a traditional semester-based format, which means that there will be days where you do game-specific courses, and there will be days where you do animation-specific courses. And there will be days where you do common courses. So the sense of a collected cohort is a lot more pronounced now, where, where at least once a week you will go together, all of you. So that's a lot better, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. besides that, then you have all of the events that happen outside of class hours, and they're always for everyone, usually. So the distinction between games and animation is less pronounced now than it has ever been. And I think that's a very healthy thing, especially now that we do a lot more games-based work in animation as well. It used to be a time where it was called interactive media on the tin, but there were very little interaction going on inside the actual <laughs> course. And I think that's a shame. So I've been, I've been working for a while to get that changed. I mean, speaking of uh, working on with, with game students, uh, if if there are some game specific courses, but maybe they need some animators and stuff, could animation students uh, kind of divert their course to work on the project with the game people? Yes, that's a possibility. Although it will need to be discussed with us first, because then we need to like then we go into the, into the assessment criteria and the and the learning outcomes of the course, because we we have we can't do whatever we want. We have strict rules we need to follow and we have our own government body that comes and looks and say oh you did that wrong <laughs> um so that's when we need to go into our papers and see yeah can we pull that off yeah yeah that can that can be interpreted at this point yeah okay go go do it <laughs> mm -hmm. so the possibility is there but i cannot say with a uh, with with confidence that yes you will always be able to do that no no maybe not but we, mm -hmm. we always try we always try to make that a possibility and yeah. same way if you yeah. Same way if you, if you have a, have an outside gig, a freelance work, for instance, because a lot of students are working while they are doing the degree with us. They're men, very often they can find a degree that, or they do a gig, then they go, hey, this kind of fits this criteria. Can I deliver that here? And we say, sure. I mean, uh, with what you've just said now, I'm assuming that if you're an animation only student, uh, that you can probably apply for game industry jobs or, or game uh, companies uh, right okay. after the animation uh, course. 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 so not just animation um, studios no but this is the this is the the lovely thing about about um, education in general this isn't just unique to us you don't know where you're gonna end up and we are very we're I mean it's it's not a vocational school but it's very practice led which means that it's sort of job specific 
your education. I mean, you, you have, if you have a degree in animation, you're most likely going to end up uh, as an animator. But if you have a degree in social anthropology, probably not going to end up as a social anthropologist because there are not that many academic positions for them around, right? You're going to end up at an office job somewhere and doing something. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens to, to, to this degree, just as any other. Like what you do a degree in doesn't necessarily dictate where you're going to end up. We're not, we're not doctors, we're not surgeons. Yeah. But saying that, uh, at some point during those three years, you should pivot into a specialism. You sh should try to pinpoint, I want to do medical visualizations. I want to do advertisements. I want to do uh, sp film special effects for... Uh, for um, the word completely escapes me. When you have real people, live action, thank you. <laughs> in, in, uh, a, a shot, right? So at some point you should pivot towards that because uh, a trap, and this is not a bad trap. This is, um, it's, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of a pitfall, but there's no spikes in the bottom, so you'll probably be fine. And that's mm -hmm. to go through three years with no real specialism and you're just a generalist. While mm -hmm. that is useful in Norway with a bunch of small companies, it's not, it's hard to get in the door. Yeah, because within the team that is trying to hire you, they probably already have all of your skills combined. Yeah, so, so that's where I'd rather say it doesn't, but it doesn't matter if it's game or film or animation, as long as you can use the tools in a valuable way to a company, apply yourself to them. Yeah, but I, th I think I think that was a reasonable sound answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the... It seems to me like you are like uh, from the class I have been with you, especially with the studio one, and you have like popped in for like um, like take a look at our like screening at some, like uh, presentations. Yep. Um, you're a really like passionate um, teacher, and you're like really you obviously like your work. Like you mentioned earlier in this like podcast, like could you tell us? Do you have any like uh, teaching ideology or methods, maybe that are different from your like high school teachers or like are you do you really think about that? Like, what is your approach when yes. it comes to teaching? I do. I do think about that, and um, I it's it's my approach to teaching is at times a little bit callous, perhaps. But also mm -hmm. a bit friendly, and I'll elaborate on that. So, the first part that I teach with is that I, I don't worry about objectivity. I'm not not necessarily worried about. Oh, I'm not your friend. I'm going to be this disembodied voice in front of a classroom. Mm -hmm. I think that's unsound. Like, yeah, sure, it's important when I'm assessing mm -hmm. to be objective. But whenever I'm in doubt, I can hand it to the rest of the team and say, hey, can I get a pair of fresh eyes on this because I'm too close? That's yeah. fine. But the second part is that if you care about what I say because you view me as your friend, consciously or unconsciously, you will listen to what I say. Yeah. And more importantly, if I also say, hey, that's not a very good idea, you will listen to what I say. And I think that's a very good approach. So, so and the best part of that it creates a whole lot safer place in the classroom, right? It's very scary to join in a class and you don't know anyone there. Mm -hmm. And I remember that when I was a student and I had large classes, right? But yeah. in my in my approach to teaching, at least you know one person there, at least you know me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one thing that I noted when I was in, say, in high school, or what since you brought it up, is that I had some teachers that I liked and some teachers that I didn't like and some teachers that I found downright scary. Mm -hmm. And I work my hardest to never become one of the scary teachers. I, you don't have to like me, that's fine, but at least you'd know that you're safe around me. That's the important part of, of my approach. That's the friendly bit. Mm -hmm. this, that's where the callous bit comes in. <laughs> and that is, I work just as much with raising the ceiling as I do with raising the floor. Which means mm -hmm. that there is a real possibility that you can be left behind if you are not able to keep up. Yeah. And that's the name of the game. Because I reward effort with effort. Not, mm -hmm. not skill. So if you work a lot in my classes, I will spend a lot of afford a lot of attention towards you and to help you out. So this mm -hmm. could be, and 
So this could mean that you might still be struggling with opening files correctly. As long as you put a lot of struggle in that, I will try to guide you as much as I can. If you show mm -hmm. up at the end of the course and like, hey, I did everything correctly, I go, cool, bye. <laughs> and that fits different people, right? So I record all of my lectures, I upload everything online, and I will never enforce mandatory attendance. You can show up for my class, you could not show up for my class, doesn't affect your grades at all. So mm -hmm. you are free to choose to direct your own learning. And I will be there, excuse me, to guide you along the way, should you mm -hmm. need it. And this is where the discipline comes in. Because mm -hmm. sadly, a lot of people don't have the self-discipline to keep up with that. Because then you can wake up in the morning and then you can go, ah, shit, I'm supposed to be in class in 20 minutes. Ah, it's going to be recorded later. I'll do it later. And then you don't do it later. <laughs> I don't, this isn't a call out. I am guilty of this myself, or was at least anyway. Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> and, but this, and this is just it, right? And this is where the, and this is the insidious part because my classes feel inclusive. They're fun. They're interactive. There are a bunch of things going on. There's, I speak very fast and there's a lot of content that I'm going through and I'm very rambly. So it's not always a red thread through this. I mean, you had me in Studio One, you know how I can go on tangents. Mm -hmm. um, so suddenly you think you haven't missed out, but then you've missed out a lot. And then you have, it's actually more of a snowball that rolls yeah. down uh, a hill. And suddenly you realize that I have missed an entire month's worth of lectures and activities. And I'm so far behind, I can't catch up. That mm -hmm. happens. That does happen. But I'm also aware, well, now you know, there is, there is personal responsibility involved in this. Yeah. Because if you don't exercise that minimum amount of agency in your own learning, you're not going to learn anything anyway. So I don't, I don't think it's worth the effort. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing I like noticed uh, the first year, which I kind of picked up on the second year and like push forward was uh, how easy it is to kind of relax when you should be constantly trying to keep up with everything. And yeah. uh, even like meeting up to class is my number one like, thing that keeps me up because it's like, okay, I have class today. And when I come home from class, I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> so that, that keeps me, that kept me a lot uh, going uh, the first year. But uh, second year, I started picking it up on my own. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think, and I think there is, a, there's a trick to that. Like, and if showing up for class is hard, then pick an easier milestone first, right? Where you go, okay, cool. I'm not going to go to class. I'm going to go to the cafe across the street from campus and buy a hot chocolate. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a big, big move, right? Because now the threshold for going for hot chocolate, a lot less than going to class. But going mm -hmm. from hot chocolate to class, that's a very low bar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you are very much correct. As long as you show up, it's a lot easier to keep working. Because we, humans, we are social creatures. If everyone around us do, around us do work, we will do work. Mm-hmm. And then you have, of course, some cults of personality appear, like where you have some very strong personalities. If they don't do work, no, 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 no people work. Yeah. So, so no, especially in large cohorts of people. I know, and I mean, this is now, now you get to know how the sausage is made. Um, <laughs> I know which students I have to like make sure they have the tools available to keep working because as long as they're working, the cohort is working. Mm -hmm. Call them ambassador students informally. I don't say to them, and I don't tell, I don't tell them that they are. I just happen to know who they are. <laughs> but they are, they, they are, they are strong influence on the entire student cohort. So I make sure that, like you know, if they can work, things are going fine. So uh, I'm wondering, um, what are the small things that give you joy as a teacher? Just a uh, like. Were there any specific like that just give you a smile through the day, like coffee? Yeah, I am. A coffee is definitely up there, um, but I think I, th I think when we're ever ever whenever we're able to crack a joke in a lab and can laugh about it, <laughs> that's the most fun thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Beyond that, what really makes me like makes this job feel worth it is whenever a student comes to me like, now oh, I finally got it. Look what I did. And then <laughs> it's something that they've spent a lot of time struggling with. 
whenever whenever those happen, that's when I'm really happy. And again, I think that's why I enjoy teaching rigging because there's so many instances of that when they finally get it. <laughs> um, so, um, how would you deal with uh, like students that which have like massive procrastination and like imposter syndrome problems, like? Like I will never forget, uh, you said this like during the first class in Studio One, and this really sticked with me and helped me like bring like discipline and like cope with imposter syndrome and procrastination. It's like you said, like there are so many that do not even um, like uh, not apply, like submit their portfolio at the end of Studio One, but uh, and because they like don't think it's good enough, but in reality it probably good so they could obviously pass so basically you said something along those lines like just submit and see what happens don't just disappear like try to submit something at least so you can evaluate it um do you have any like uh how how would you like do you have any tips or how do you as a teacher deal with such students I do, I do. And it's not necessarily about dealing with such students because I I meet those fears myself every day. Both procrastination, that's perhaps a larger uh, bugbear in my life nowadays than imposter syndrome, but that too. And th there are days I go into a class and I sit there like, I'm such a hack. I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing. That's Don't listen to that voice. It's there. It's ever present. But mm -hmm. the... I think the first part to know is that that procrast pro procrastination and and imposter syndrome are are two two very different things. Though imposter syndrome might lead to procrastination, mm -hmm. it doesn't work the other way around. Pro yeah. No amount of procrastination will cause imposter syndrome. Luckily, <laughs> I'm very happy that's not a cyclical <laughs> cyclical thing. Otherwise, we'd all been just anxiety driven, useless little creatures huddling in a corner. Um, so no, I think. I think the good thing about procrastination, and this will actually help back to the uh, the um, the uh, uh, imposter syndrome thing, is that catch yourself in thinking like a perfectionist, because there is a lot of terrain between good enough, good, and perfect. In fact, you might not be able to vocal what is perfect, but you mm -hmm. can only vocal what is good enough. What is the minimum requirements? And work towards that. So in, in catching yourself and thinking like a perfectionist doesn't mean that you are, but it means that, oh, it's not good enough, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Well, stop doing that. Because the, the um, think about it in your recipient's case, because you're always making something for someone in case of delivery, right? You are... Making an, making an assignment to deliver to me so that I can qualify that you know what you're doing. If you don't deliver to me, you've qualified in, you, you've, you've told me that, oh, I can qualify you as not knowing what you're doing. That's a guaranteed zero. It can't get worse. It literally mm -hmm. can't get worse than that. Mm -hmm. right. So, so the, the, the reality of it is that if you submit something to me, you might fail. But it's not a zero. It might be 20. And then you could do a really good report. And that report might bring you up to a pass. Good, lucky you. Fantastic. Or if it's a fail, then you do it again. Either way, it still wasn't a zero. And you made, gave that decision to me. Don't shoot yourself in the foot by taking that decision for me. That's not your job. That's my job. I am being paid to do that job. You cannot waste my time. <laughs> right? And the same thing goes for 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 uh, uh, other works as well, right? It's a very clear cut example in school, but outside of that, like, are you? If you make a piece of work and you put it online, beautiful likes on on ArcStation. Sure, it's not perfect. Not everyone's gonna love it, but someone might. You might get ten likes, twelve likes, one hundred and twenty thousand likes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Someone liked it, and isn't that enough? That's my first thing. That's my first thing in procrastination is that just catch yourself in thinking that that it doesn't have to be perfect. Only has to be good enough. The mm -hmm. second part is is taking control of procrastination. 
This is something I, I learned in an interview. Uh, I was listening to a comedian, Tim Minchin, speak. And he was asked, why, why is he so damn good at playing piano? And this is funny. Because uh, when he was in school, he didn't want to do homework. <laughs> homework was the worst. So, so, but whenever you don't do something, and you, you all know this, right? You feel guilty. You know you should have done better. So therefore, you procrastinate into something reasonably useful. I'm sure you've noticed that when you have a deadline, suddenly it's a lot easier to do dishes and do the laundry mm-hmm. and do housework. That's procrastination. That's the power of procrastination. So the second part that I really, really encourage people to do is reflect on when you are procrastinating because that way you can actually get things done while you are waiting to get started. Damn. And that I think is important to go like, like, okay, cool. If you have a project, if you have a passion project for modeling, have your files ready. So when then you're not doing your work that you should be doing, you have your modeling scene open and you do some modeling work. For me, like, like whenever I'm procrastinating, I'm making Warhammer medias and printing them. That's my now procrastination bugbear. But just mm-hmm. have that time, like, because you cannot stop procrastinating. It will always be there. It's human experience, but take control of it. Master it, if you will. I mean, speaking of that, actually, like when, uh, when I went to um, a middle school in eighth grade, yeah. um, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do homework because I want to play League of Legends. Uh, but uh, I couldn't play League of Legends because that's wasting time. So I was actually uh, making, I was learning coding in Roblox. Uh, and that's the reason I'm here now. Uh, so, so whenever I'm doing these courses, I'm like, I don't want to write the project report. So I go to the portfolio and start coding and, and doing my stuff. Uh, no. But yeah. <laughs> no, but that is that is that is that wisdom crystallized, right? Um, <laughs> so take control of it. And, and also, and this goes actually to this is a this is a bit of a PSA. Don't feel that you've wasted time playing games. I'll do you use League of Legends, for example, as an example, right? Um, we mentioned earlier that there's a 10,000 hour rule, right? It's not exactly 10,000 hours, but you know the saying. Um, I think I have about 3,000 hours of League of Legends playtime underneath my belt <laughs> or, or something like that. It's like some in, insane amount of time. And I'm still like Wood League. I'm I'm object terrible at that game. And I've spent a lot of thousands, just just thousands, both thousands on skins. I don't regret a single second, right? This is a life advice. This also goes again for the imposter syndrome. Oh, people that are better than me do all the work. Yeah, sure, sure they are. That's why they're better. But it doesn't mean that you've wasted your life. If you had fun, that time was not wasted we in life need something to live for and something to live off sure you can be the best game designer in the world if you commit all your time to to producing games good luck with that by the way that's hard <laughs> but if you're if you are able to do that it does not guarantee you'd be happy there is no guaranteed happiness prize at the end of the perfect work because you mm-hmm. can't be more than happy it doesn't work like that so that's mm-hmm. that's my PSA. Never, you can regret not spending time to work because you didn't work, but don't regret the time you spent doing something else because that if that something else was fun. Mm-hmm. There's there's a distinction there. Mm-hmm. Damn. Yeah. Slight lessons. Yeah. No. 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 Uh, don't don't get me started. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So. so. Let's move Let's a little move. bit for the fun questions. The, you mentioned League of Legends, and I. This is another thing you like mentioned in the beginning of the podcast. Like, ah, yeah, yeah. The students that only listen, like, uh, they only maybe remember six to twelve minutes of what I'm saying, or something like that. Yeah, that was those the best minutes, really Yeah, those six minutes for me in your class were. Uh, like at the beginning always when you're like <laughs> when Elden Ring ca- came out and you're like talking to us like um, I was just trying to kill this boss and you're just talking about Elden Ring like and the, how you're like 
but how much you enjoy the game. Like, do you, like, what games do you play? Like, are there any well, games you're playing currently, or do you have any favorite games? I, I, I do. I, do. I think, I think in, in actually in that, that particular lecture we're referring to there, I think that did terrible damage to the student cohort. Because I also said a thing, and this is the one thing a lot of people remember from the class. Please, guys, don't send me messages at Teams after hours because it will minimize my Elden Ring and I, and I yeah. die. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of people remembered that. And suddenly, <laughs> I just, people stopped reaching out. That wasn't the point. Just don't reach out on Teams outside of office hours because I can't, I can't turn it off. <laughs> but no, out of my favorite games that I play, uh, I play an obscene amount of Dungeons and Dragons. That's by far my favorite game. Mm -hmm. I just love it. So much fun. Play that more than any other game, probably combined. Um, you play the new Baldur's Gate 3 then? I haven't actually. <laughs> this, this is intentional because I, I, right now I do not have the time to put away 200 hours of my life into that <laughs> game, which I know I am going to do once I start. So, so I I know that just like when Christmas comes around and things ease us off, then you know, then I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> no, as it stands right now, like, no way, no way. I will play it. I will play it. Just haven't yet. I mean, I I haven't played Tears of the Kingdom for the same reason. But whenever I whenever I get uh, so I might play that first. But either way, uh, as far as computer games concerned, I think my favorite game. It's uh, it my one that you haven't heard about. It's called RimWorld. Oh, uh, that's one yeah. of the top rated games on Steam, I think. Yeah, no, it's absolutely fantastic. It's, it's so much fun. And uh, whenever I play it, it's like, whoa, 30 hours gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, it's, uh, RimWorld, RimWorld is probably my favorite game. I, it changes, but throughout time, I think it's been RimWorld. Yeah. yeah. Is, uh, are you... Are you like uh, this is an Elden Ring question? Have you become an Elden Lord, Eric? I have indeed, and that is one of your hidden talents. It's, I presume, you are an Elden Lord. Yes. I, do you have any more hidden talents that you would like to tell us about? Talents. Hmm. No, actually, I do not. And that is perhaps one of the things that feed my imposter syndrome is that I don't consider myself particularly good at anything. And that that bugbear comes and haunts me at night and go like, yeah. So, so no, I, I don't I don't actually have any hidden talents. No, but I, I suppose. I suppose this is perhaps a, a, a the last life lesson. I don't follow this myself, but perhaps some some of the other listeners might. It might, everyone has a hidden talent, just that hidden talent might be so good at hiding that you yourself haven't found it yet. <laughs> it's one day. I, I, just... I feel that was really smart, even though I don't actually practice that. I just preach it. That's valid. Yeah. That's valid. Right there. So I, I'm pretty I'm sure, sure I'm not, I'm trying to back it up, but did I read from your LinkedIn? page that you know Japanese or did I just misread that? No, you didn't. I, I am conversational in it, at least uh, at least I used to be. Um, so obviously so not a language I use a lot. So um, it's I resting would... more and more, more and more every single day. But um, I would I say am... that it... hmm? I would say that is a hidden talent. I didn't yes, know that. Yes, perhaps. No, I think in uh, I've only had the time to use it on occasion in class. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when whenever I have students come up and they just regurgitate dweeb shit. And then I go like, no, in my class, speak proper Japanese. You don't speak it at all. <laughs> that is perhaps my hidden talent. I'm an I I'm an arch weeb. Mm -hmm. So so at that um it's, it creeps up there. But I, I had a trial by five the other day. My, my friend, he, uh, he lives in Japan and he has a girlfriend. It's Chinese, but they speak Japanese to each other. And then suddenly I was on an open air mic and he said, like, and I could, I could hear him say to his girlfriend that, oh, there's on, there's on the other end and he speaks some Japanese. So just be careful what you say. I, I completely froze. I had a full on, just perfect opportunity to just speak, practice my Japanese. And I just, I died froze. 
Couldn't do it. <laughs> so um, I'm coming to the point in life where I probably have to take that down from my LinkedIn page because I don't know if it's true anymore. And man, that feels like a defeat. You're <laughs> just add things on there, never take things off. <laughs> uh, I have one question that's kind of like, uh, it's it's kind of fun, but it's uh, it's like a mystery. Uh, was there anything a student made during the first year that made you go, wow, this could be a massive franchise or like this might be a future prodigy of a student? Um, I am not quite sure how to take that question, actually. Um, for the franchise one, generally, no. Most first year work is not that interesting this is going to sound really bad um but what happens right and, and when you start to be creative is that all of us have creative pipes and i'm using pipes here because pipes get clogged up it's a bunch of in in your house indoor um, pipes there's a bunch of of uh, calcium and, and and fat residue that starts to put on the inside that needs to be flushed away first the same thing happens to our creative pipes but what gets flushed away first isn't like fat stains, it's affection. So mm -hmm. it's your appreciation that comes out first, right? So whenever I see, oh, this is my really cool idea, I've been having it for a long time, and I go, mm-hmm, that's, I don't tell them this, but I think, oh, that's nice. I can tell that you really like this show. Because I don't see an original idea, I see a very passionate love letter to an already existing franchise, already existing style. And once, throughout the first and second year, once you've like cleaned out all of those, that, that affection out of your system, that's when you have like pure creativity rushing out. Mm. So uh, no, no, I generally don't see first year work being like, wow, this is sort of a franchise I go, cool, <laughs> how about we do something? So, so you like see a lot of like, like characters like and worlds and you like ah uh, i watched that movie before and i see you're a fan of for some let's just say because i'm a fan of lord of the rings you, you yep. can like see yep. just yep that's a lot of ring ring uh, lord of the rings reference and yep. when do you say uh like there's this thing when you as an artist and designers we should always have references with us and do research behind what we are doing so um isn't it a quite a fine line between like uh, falling into the pit of writing a love letter to like the franchise, for example, Star Wars maybe and and something else, some sci-fi or yeah, and like finding a reference and be creative with it, like taking cubes to and reorganizing them. Hmm, good question. So I think uh, in saying that, I don't think it's a bad thing to do a love letter. I really don't think so. I think whenever I see someone making a love letter in their work mm -hmm. uh, when they're starting out, like I go good, even if they are not starting out anymore. Like I do, I do stuff like that all the time, and I think that's that's yeah. fine. It's not it's not a defeat. Yeah. Um, it might if if you if you went in with the outset that like I'm gonna be I'm gonna make something no one has ever seen before, then good luck because there's nothing new under the sun, and B then then you failed. But there is value in, re in, in recreating other people's work, especially like uh, professional value in it, because mm -hmm. most likely you are not going to have the professional uh, creative freedom in making your own things when you are in a job. You are being paid to realize someone else's creative vision. That's why they need you, because mm -hmm. they can't make it themselves. That's the job, which means that, say, if you're... If you're going to try apply for a job at Nintendo, like don't don't I don't recommend working in Japan, but let's assume that you are. Uh, then you know don't have a don't have your showreel filled with assets that would be good for um, for Rockstar, for instance. Like that's not what Nintendo is looking for. So there is a definite value in writing good love letters. And also wearing inspiration on your sleeve. That's not, not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Not in a million years. Yeah, I yeah. forgot the question because my tangent was too long. But... <laughs> yeah, I think you answered it pretty well, actually. There, uh, there was this, there is 
actually like I forgot forgot to mention it before you answered the question was that you say like there's nothing new under the sun and that's like the the quote from Eric Hammer that is like really stick to me. I know we have only had one class, but I learned so much from like Studio One when it comes to like just the, the first steps of into this education. You know, there's so many things that resonated with me like into the second year, into like now the third year from just that course because it's my first long, uh, my first long college like course. So yeah. Um, I don't, uh, this is pretty like fun question. Like, what is your favorite like animation picture? Because you're like each an animation, you probably watch some like like got some like inspiration from other movies, right? I, I do, uh, and I think um, what's my favorite animated feature? Oh, good, good question. I mean, I think like uh, obviously we've we've mentioned Frozen, and I always have to give a nod to that because that's the the, mm. the film that got me into the thing. Um, but I think as far as animated features go, I think my favorite would be Spirited Away, mm. although I practically never watch it. Mm. But that. Yeah, just in hindsight, I really enjoy that film, just for the breadth breadth of animation that's within it. How about the new Puss in Boots? I How haven't seen like it yet. I have told my third years to stop discussing it because it's spoilers. <laughs> oh my god! Just watch it tonight. I, like honestly, <laughs> you need to do work, Eric. It's like I think you will be amazed. Yeah, I know. I can do it. Like I can, I can, I can watch that during office hours and not have it be wasted. <laughs> but I haven't heard it yet. Yeah, no, it's like um, no, and if, as far as comfort animation is concerned, uh, I think, do I? I every other year or so, I rewatch the entire film as Alchemist uh, Brotherhood. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's that's an that's an animation that's close to my heart. Is it the theme, or is it? Do you just like the style? Pacing, the pacing actually. I think it's like it's um, it's a perfectly delivered story. In, in terms of structure and, and uh, excitement. Mm. Also, the theme and theming of it is absolutely fantastic. I really enjoy the themes. And it's, 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 I, I mentioned the previously that that story doesn't have to be drenched in meaning to be funny. And then I pull out that show, which is just drenched in meaning. <laughs> How about any favorite like villains or protagonists? Like yeah, there's a specific section in your studio where like you talk about what resembles like in character design, like villains and everything, and mm -hmm. what your characters look like. Do you have any favorites? I do very clearly. I I always favor Darth Vader over every other villain that exists. My man, I <laughs> love that villain so much. So, and I in and I will say I do love him more, um, in spite of the the prequels. Because I didn't need to know Darth Vader's background. That was not important to me. And this is something that, that, that I've, I see as a little bit of an unfortunate trend mm -hmm. in uh, contemporary storytelling. Is that, oh, you have to give the villain a sad background to make them relatable. To understand why they do it the way they do. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> they can just be bad. It's fine. Darth Vader was this skull mask thing that just came and messed shit up and he was just he was just all bad all bad you didn't stop to question it mm -hmm. you don't uh, and i think that today like we don't i don't need to see what how putin's childhood was to relate to his bad actions no it's just bad <laughs> villains exist <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, as as far as everyone's a hero in their own story, I don't believe that. Uh, <laughs> but I also don't think we need to understand the motivation of every single villain all the time. I don't think that's necessary. And I think the original series Darth Vader was a a uh, very very good symbol of that because you do explore him after some time, right? A even in the original trilogy. 
right? Where you go like, no, I am your father. It never really goes beyond that for how he became bad. It was just the idea that, oh no, there's still good in you. How he became bad was given. He was, he's a bad man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah. And and that's, yeah, no, that's, that's on the simple villain scale. I think on the complicated villain, then it has to be Silco. Yeah. I forgot about that. Just until the favorite animation, Arcane, hands down. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Arcane. Ar Arcane, favorite animation of all time. Yeah. Yeah. No chance. I think Arcane is the is ten out of ten. Out of 10. I I have no words for it. It's like just flawless for me. Yeah. I loved it. Season two is not far away now. Yeah, and I think it's coming yeah. next uh, next year or during uh, the the autumn because of worlds. Yep. So they want to time it a bit, probably. And the uh, the last sorry, Marcus. No, I was just gonna say. Uh, uh, I'm just looking forward to seeing characters that I enjoy looking at from League. Um, so it's like, oh, these characters, great show. Where's my favorite character? <laughs> I'm like, no. Oh. Um, there's a, there, there's a the last question, and I've like put it for the last. Um, teachers chemistry. Uh, we I asked Joshua on on the episode two if I remember correctly about game nights that teachers have and if i remember correctly he uh, he mentioned you like playing board games with him and yes. he said uh, he was the best <laughs> at board game yes that, Are you is, that is still true joshua so so john joshua and i we usually go play board games and um seven out of ten games joshua wins Two out of ten games, I win, and then that that odd last one out of ten is probably John. <laughs> but you can you can generally assume that Joshua is winning because he just he just you know, has this just it, superhuman ability to just see the interplay between mechanics, mm -hmm. and then he's just like cool, and there I won. Doesn't matter which <laughs> game it is or how many times we played it, we can open a completely brand new game and he'll just beat us at it like again and again and again. Do you think so he has the, uh, do you think he has the advantage know. because he teaches gameplay? No, I think <laughs> he is the good person, the best person for gameplay for that reason. <laughs> he can That's figure out your mechanics and patterns like in an instance. Yeah. <laughs> really quickly. Yeah, it's it's wild. It's a soundboard games with because then then I I I uh, soundboard ideas through him because so, I I come up with like mad ideas. Oh, wouldn't this be fun for a game? And then he goes, mm, no. <laughs> so would you say it's a, like a good chemistry? Uh, uh, like overall with your teacher, like like Diego, Eric, uh, Felipe, Joshua, you yourself. Yes, I would. I'd, uh, the the IM department is hands down the best work environment I've ever been in out of across all my jobs. Yeah, so, yeah. it's 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 lovely. It's uh, and it's I, I, probably a large reason I've been teaching for so long because I mean, I spend a lot of time in a classroom, but it's actually, matter of fact, most of the time at work is outside the classroom in the office. So mm -hmm. if the time in the office weren't as enjoyable as it is, I wouldn't have been doing this for so long. So <laughs> yeah, no, easily the best work environment I've been in. All right. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I think we have gone through all the questions. Thank, cool. thank cool. you for spending the time with us. It was a fantastic talk. Great to get to know you, Eric. And for the students that are wondering to apply for Nora for a first or second year or third year even, now you know more about Eric Hammer. Thank you. <laughs>